Okay, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Marco Figosi. Uh, also, it's an Italian name, I'm all the way from Brazil. Uh, actually, I am here because I could not be to Marrakesh this weekend, unfortunately, but it is really a true pleasure to be here and talk to you. I can tell you a little bit of my country's history and share some of my opinions regarding the future of historic vehicles around here. So, first, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, I am 21 years old, born and raised in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Today, I am the technical director at Alfa Romeo Club of Brazil and the sports and technical director at MG Club of Brazil. Together with that, I've been nominated a Brazilian member of the FIVA Yaus Group. And apart from all the modern world as a career and to in college, majoring in business administration at INSPER. Uh, let me briefly tell you how did I got involved with historic vehicles. So, one second. So, uh, my grandpa was in to, into English cars in the 80s and 90s, and he was a pioneer on regularity rallies around the south of Brazil. And then he moved on to southern Brazil to Sao Paulo and did rallies with the MG Club. And he was just the kind of guy that used to bring the whole family to these events. And my dad was basically his biggest companion. When he passed away in the early 2000s, the family ended up selling the car because at the time there was no time for my uncles and my dad to keep the cars and do the maintenance and everything. And suddenly when I was 14 years old, that was 2015, I began to show interest in cars and obliged my dad to go every weekend all the way to the city and look for cars, classic cars, go to classical shops and counters and everything surrounding that. Until one day in 2015, I think it was late 15, we bought a Fiat 124 Spider in the countryside and restored it and started to attend these car meetings with more frequency and we made some great friendship. And as they say, the rest is history. Uh, but let's not talk about me for a while. Let's talk about Brazil. Uh, to show you the future, in my opinion, I ought to tell you and give you some context of the past. So Brazil, uh, as you, sorry, I've got something on the screen. Brazil uh, used to be a car heaven, especially in Rio de Janeiro, the capital city at the time. But it was not unusual to go to Rio de Janeiro and hear huge engine noises echoing to Ipanema or luxurious sports cars strolling to Copacabana. And there were plenty of races as Gavia and Boa Vista with high rewards, which attracted many pilots and private racing teams from all around the world. Those would compete and sell their cars here to huge profits. So Bon Vivants would buy the secondhand cars, which were really, as we can see in the, the picture on the right, Maserati 300 asses racing against a Ferrari 750. And you just don't believe what there was here. There were plenty of Alpha 8Cs, Maserati 4CMs, everything. So you might be wondering now, if Brazil had such a rich fauna of classic cars, where are they now? And how could they buy them? Uh, first of all, Brazil is a very rich country. Uh, although it's basically one of the world's biggest GDPs, it has a huge wealth inequality, which basically enabled the 1% to buy a lot of cars and the rest of them to follow up with a very rich culture of automobiles, which ended up leading to a whole success in the, in the motorsport and everything related to that. And also our whole infrastructure was built based on automobiles. We have a lot of roads, a lot of highways, and, and every Brazilian dream started in an automobile. But things changed in 1975 when the importation ban was announced for the next year. So from 1976, to 1990, Brazilian was, were basically impeached to buy any cars from abroad, fueling the national industry. But as many cars were produced and they were absolutely beautiful in terms of design, the mechanics fell short and they may mostly exhibit some out-of-date technologies. 
some of the remarkable cars I can tell you is the Alpha 2300, the SP2, which was a completely Brazilian project, the Puma, and some that came in very limited batches as the Hofstetter. <clears throat> Marco, can you, also, there... Marco, can you uh, wait a second? There is a little window over your presentation and we're trying to close that. So bear with us for a few seconds uh, until we close. No worries. Everybody can see the picture. Thank you. Looks like it's uh, so dark back there that I can't find a mouse. Okay, Marco, please continue. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Uh, as you can see. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, you can see the images? Yep, we can see your images. Yeah. Thank you. So you can see the Hofstadt, the SP2, the Alpha Rio, which was called the Puma and the Bianco. And so let's follow. Okay. But uh, there are a lot of cars. I cannot talk to all, through all of them right now. And they're not the main point of this presentation. But the impact they had in a past day society and its reflection today is. But we'll get there eventually. Now, Back to the topic I said before, if Brazil had that many special cars, where are they now? The answer is quite simple. Some of them are still around. Some of them saw their end in a scrapyard, as the Voisin 28C you've seen before. But a great number of them were exported. If you read Colin Crabbe's Thrill of the Chase, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, there are four chapters dedicated exclusively to Brazil. What happened was a consequence of the complete isolation from the outer market, allied to an absolute lack of qualified labor and parts, which led to Colin and his friend Dino Weiss buying hundreds of automobiles and sending them to US and Europe. But that was not the end. We may not have as rich as fauna as our neighbors, the Uruguayan or Argentinians, but we do still have some very special cars here and very special events. As you can see, uh, there are some luxurious events, yes, which brings many cars, the Zota, the Cords, the Ferraris, but there are also huge public events, as EBAA in Agua Gilindoya, which gathered basically 400,000 people over four days, with more than 1,000 cars attending. It is the largest encounter in Latin America. But what is most important here is to understand who are these people that attend all these kind of events. I've brought you two stats. One is the Facebook analytics data regarding the number of unique likes in the FPVA, the Brazilian Federation of Antique Vehicles, Facebook page, and the other is the FIVA survey of Brazil. Although we know Facebook has a bias given it's a technological tool and it lowers the age, the information it contains is extremely relevant. We can see that around 50% of the audience grew up during the deportation ban. All they knew growing up were the cars we had around here. So those will be the cars their sons and daughters hear about because those are the cars they will be emotionally attached to. Most importantly, uh, they will tell them a reality they lived in, in which European and American cars broke a lot. Because of course, without any proper maintenance and no parts, they're bound to keep you on the street. The cars that did not break were the air and water cooled Volkswagens, probably because those could even function without any oil or water and everything. So how can we describe this Brazilian generation? We can clearly state they that will have an emotional attachment to national cars an admiration for young timers, which are the cars they're growing up with, and a misled that HVs are unreliable. And again, I'm talking about 99.5% of the people, but there are exceptions. And the responsibility to showing them the truth lies in the exception hands, it lies in our hands. 
With this new generation, things will change. It is inevitable. Therefore, clubs, groups, and every kind of social encounter must evolve to this new context. And the point I'm trying to highlight here is that this context is not only made by the owners. It's made by everyone that keeps the passion we have alive. It's from the painter to the mechanic to the historian, everyone who is involved in the movement and can add value to it. Given that, I want to tell you a little bit what Alfa Romeo Club of Brazil is doing to keep this passion alive. Uh, I divide it in three topics, which basically the first one is the young directory, where all the functions and responsibilities are passed down to newcomers of a younger generation, so they can actively participate in the club's decision and have a voice. They are engaged into it. The second are a series of historical documentaries available via YouTube, which eternalize stories of the Brazilian motorsport and make them accessible for everyone, literally everyone that can go online. And if we inspire only one people, it's one people more who is engaged to the movement. The third and most interest of them all is the Young Restore program in development. Sorry, there was a huge noise. Can you still hear me? We can still hear you, thank you. Okay, sorry, there was just huge noise in the background. Okay, the third uh, is the Young Restore program, where we are creating an Alfa Romeo subject within a restoration school, where the associates and guests will act as pro bono teachers of mechanics, bodywork, upholstery, and every other part of the restoration process, helping by acting in the context I mentioned introducing a brand and its history to a new generation and giving opportunity to many people who need it. For the last part, I would like to give you all my personal insight on the future of the HV movement and how it is in Brazil and how can we change it. First of all, uh, I ought to tell you that the new generation, at least in my point of view here in Brazil, from what I see, we like cars. We may not like the idea of having a daily driver. There are many reasons to explain that. There's intense traffic, the environmental factors, the current price paid to keep an automobile on the road, but none of them prevent us from having a weekend drive. Then what are the problems of attracting younger people? First of all, for someone starting a life, if not in the relative support of the movement, a classic automobile is very expensive and getting more each day, not just to buy, but to maintain as well. Together with the fear of constant problems, the lack of knowledge about the market and the maintenance providers, it's a very serious problem, which basically impeaches people from getting in to know people. And how can we add these people to our movement? I've built some sort of a simplified three-step process to illustrate the hypothesis. First of all is step A, the inspiration or the introduction. The historical vehicles world is shown to this person of the new generation, lightly, that is, the fun side we all fell in love with, driving around town or strolling to a highway, meeting new people and discovering a whole new world, one in which the more you know, the less you actually know. Then step B, the opportunity. Having or not an automobile invites these people, invite these people to events and encounters for them to start to know people. Try to connect subjects with something as very as, as this can be. It can be like college studies, watches, everything in between. So that they know it isn't all about cars. There are a lot of people in it, very interesting people that we, we meet along the way. The third and final step, it's engagement, in which the person does join the social club or group. It not, must not be a classic car club. It could be just a group that meets on Fridays, Saturdays for, for brunch. It must not be something that formal, but the person is already linked to the movement. And later, there must be participating. These young people like to talk, they like to, to show their mind, they like to show their vision. So we ought to give them 
a little bit of a space to talk. Uh, I know it's not that simple in real life, but events like this one, which gives youngsters like I am a voice, even that it is for a few minutes only, show that we are on the right path. Thank you very much for your time. I would like to thank a special, a special thanks to FRMVE and LAMIA for all the organization involved with this huge event, to FIVA, Natasha, and Gautam for the invitation to speak at the symposium, to FBVA for the opportunity given to me, to the MG Club of Brazil, and late and last, but definitely not least, to the Alfa Romeo Club of Brazil and the late Master Decio Mastoropo for putting his faith in me.